Welcome to the past exam question go through of SBR. Now, let's look at the question called Greer Company from the March and June 2023 exam. It's the question one, and we are told about 30 marks for this question, and we are given four requirements there. Now, let's see the requirement part A. So, we are required to use the exhibit one information and to evaluate the reasons why the company called G complete rather than the layout can be identified as the acquirer in the business combination. So we know that business combination is according to the IFRS number three. Now <clears throat> within the IFRS number three there, firstly you know that uh, there would be clear guidance of how to identify the acquirer and the acquiree. And secondly, you will need to think about the acquisition accounting okay, within the IFRS number 3, including the calculation of goodwill. But in this particular requirement, we are required to identify whether or not, I mean why, the G company is the acquirer. I'll tell you how in a second. So usually the IFRS number 3, that the acquirer will be a larger entity. So for example, the G company, must be larger than the L company to a certain extent, and this is why the G company is the acquirer. Of course, in the part A, when we are answering this question, we can also bring the IFRS number 10, the consolidated financial statement concept in how to determine control. So in other words, the parent should be the acquirer. And if you can confirm that the acquirer, for example, the G company is the parent, of course, G complete would be the acquirer here. Now, part B then, using the exhibit 2 information, and we're going to be uh, required to explain with calculations how the goodwill arising on the acquisition date. So this means that the subsequent measurement, including the impairment of goodwill, and also the forex, foreign exchange rate changes, differences, we are not required to consider into them in this requirement. Uh, so, we are given five marks here, so if I were you, I'll allocate possibly uh, the majority of marks, for example, four in terms of calculation, and also because in this paper I know that when we are calculating goodwill, nine out of ten, that would be a step acquisition, and this is why the treatment of the first consideration for the gains and losses, we're going to be putting them into the PNL, and that will earn me another mark. Now, let's move on to part C, using the exhibit to explain with calculations. So, the exam will always tell you that in this paper, the main focus will be the explanation rather than simply the calculations. How the G company will account for the investment in G, okay, in another G company, which means the uh, G company in the consolidated financial statement. Right. We are given nine marks there. Okay, so we're going to be seeing the exhibit three in a second. But just to give you a flavour here, is that the exhibit three we talked about from the trade investment in fair value through OCI to the investment in associate of, of how we account for it. Part dot then using the exhibit number four there. Okay, it's quite clear by the examining team. Calculate and briefly outline in accordance with IVAS now financial instrument how the loan would be accounted for during the period uh, from 20x6 to 20x7, okay, these two years. Now we are given six marks here. I must say that this requirement, if you want to get the full marks, it will be quite difficult indeed. But if you were to get four out of six, and that would be absolutely easy enough, because there would be a very complicated accounting requirement in the IFRS number 9 regarding the modification of that loan. Okay, so we're going to be determining whether or not that would be substantial or not substantial. And of course, in this requirement, the de-examining team has specifically said that it is not substantial okay, in this particular case. And this is why we're going to be bringing the differences into the PNL and that's it. But if you want to achieve the full marks, and that will be very, very difficult indeed. But if you want to pass this question, question one, and that will be absolutely easy for you to do that. So make sure that you always stick that rule, stick to that rule that one mark equals to one sentence. 
Now, let's see the case background firstly. It's called the Greer Company. It's a listed parent, right? And it's the manufacturing group and preparing for the group financial statement. We are given the following exhibit firstly, by the layout company and goodwill related to layout and the investment in another company called G and the loan agreement, right? So this is why we are required to answer four parts here. So now let's see the exhibit one. So exhibit one relates to the part A. The part A is going to be evaluate reasons why the G company can be the acquirer. Of course, this requirement is more than five marks, and this is why my answer will certainly be, firstly, I will split into the IFRS requirement related to part A, followed by application to the case, and finally, to give my conclusion of what is going on. Okay, so this is important to split your answer into three parts there. Right, now moving on then, exhibit one. We are told the Greer company who shares a listing and the layout company is an unlisted company entered into a business combination in two stages. I mean, when I was reading the exhibit one information, it was, it was so complicated indeed. And, and my best approach, okay, that the advice I can give to my students is to always draw what is going on, okay, onto the piece of paper. Now, this means that we have got the G company as the layout company, or L company for short. And G company is going to buy the layout in two stages. Right, let's move on. On 1st January X7, G company purchased 35% share capital of L and voting rights for cash. Right, okay, just put them down. On 1st January X7, the G company buys 35% shares in L company for cash. And of course, the voting right is 35% there. Less than 50%. So this seems to me that uh, we have got significant influence over the L company's operating and financing policy. So this means that it's highly likely that so far the L company is our associate. Okay, just put all the things in before you draw a conclusion of that. And then on 1st April, that the G company acquires the remaining 65% shares. So this means that initially 35% and then 65%, no NCI, because we've got control and uh, obtaining 100% of the, of the L company. And by issuing new shares, right, so we are not spending our cash out, Okay, to, to purchase the remaining 65% shares. So this means that on 1st April X7, the G company buys 65% shares in L using share for share exchange. So this means that no NCI at all because we own 100%, which means the controlling interest being 100% there in L company. So of course, so far, the L company should be the subsidiary of the G company. And we are told, next paragraph, on 1st April, that G company has a market value of $70 million, and the L company has a market value of $90 million. Right, so, which means on this date, I would say that the market value of G and L respectively, that would be 70 and 90. So in other words, total would be 160 million. Okay, so uh, that's all we can do. And if I were to take 70, divide this into 170, uh, 160, that would account for approximately 43.75%. And that becomes 56.25% of a total market value. So it seems to me that in terms of market value, as we can see that the G company is a smaller company.
In identifying the acquirer, so usually it will be a larger entity. However, due company is a smaller entity, so let's move on. The due company business represent 44% uh, and layout business 50% of the total value of the combined business. Right, okay, so 44 and 56%, so 44 and 56%. Of a combined business, okay, just approximate to those figures. The examiner has, has done you a favour. Uh, after first April 20x7, the former shareholders of the G owned 51%, and the former shareholders of L owned 49% of the voting rights of a combined entity. So this means that after the acquisition, we can see the new entity here that 51% of the voting shares owned by the G company and 49% of the voting shares owned by L company. So it seems that, okay, so we dominate more than 51, 50 percent of the voting shares. So of course, the G complex control over that entity. And surely, the G complex will be the acquirer in this instance. Right, okay, so next paragraph then. On 1st April, the purchase agreement provided a new board of directors of a combined entity, combining or com comprising six board members of the G company and two board members of the L company. So this means that after the acquisition, we can see that the new company's board, so we have got six from the G company and another two from the L company in a board. So this means that more than 50% of the management comes from the G company, so that would be another clue that we've got control over that company, and surely we will be the acquirer. And the CEO of the layout is the CEO of a combined entity. Okay, so that adds a bit complication in this case, is that the CEO of a new company comes from the L company. So in essence, yes, it, it, it certainly has uh, the significant influence over the, the combined entity because the CEO would determine the overall strategic direction of a new company. And we're told the board of directors nominates the members of the management team, but CEO has significant influence over the selection of the team. All right. Now, what CEO does is this. The board members, yes, will need to determine who will be the new members coming into the board and will be nominated by all the board members. However, CEO will certainly have a, have a say that who should be coming to the board. But this would not necessarily mean that L company will control the whole board. It seems to me that still the G company controls the whole board because uh, whoever wants to join the board okay, of the new entity, that all board members will have a vote okay, for that. Finally, we're told the management team comprises the CEO and five other members, three from the G company and two from the layout company. Okay, so we have got the, using other colour, is that the management team members that three and two, sorry, a five and two, plus the CEO, and CEO is from the L company, two from the L company, and five from the G company. Oh, so in terms of numbers in, in the management team, still the G company can dominate the management team. And, and it seems to me that, of course, the G company will be the acquirer in this case. 
I would say a very complicated scenario indeed, but you need to know what is going on. So if you don't know about the IVAS very business combinations, for this particular uh, IVAS, uh, the specific requirements related to the acquirer and acquiree accounting, uh, so before we determine the acquisition accounting in the IVAS 3, and it's highly unlikely the students can get any marks regarding this treatment or requirement. Now, I would say that per the IFRS, sort of things I can say to the examining team is that firstly, according to the IFRS, which means the business combinations, of course, I will show you my full answers in a second, that what I would do is that firstly, I would say that the acquirer would usually be controlling the acquiree company. So what we can do is that we can say usually we will spend cash to buy shares. Now in this case it's the original 35% but subsequently if we use share for share exchange uh, we need to determine that who will be the acquirer so there will be several rules or clues that we can find from the case. So firstly, who dominates the management team? In this case, it's the G company. And the voting shares, which company has the larger voting shares? In this case, it's the G company. And usually will be the larger entity. In this case, of course, unluckily, that would be an L company. But this would not say that because the, in terms of market value, the M, that the L company is larger, so the L company is the acquirer. We never said that. Okay. So not only we can quote the IVAS related to business combinations, but, but we can also quote the IVAS related to the consolidation, which means the IVAS 10 there. So you can see that, okay, so if you meet with the PAR criteria, which means we've got a power instrument, that we've got more than 50% of voting shares, we can direct its relevant activities related to the strategic part, and we can get the variable returns from the L company. So if that's the case, then we have control over the L company. So in terms of applications there, so uh, I would say that Okay, I will bring my application in red, okay, here. Now, firstly, whether or not we've got control, the answer is yes, because we've got more than 51% of voting shares. Uh, I can also say that 51% of voting shares will be our power instrument, okay? So we're not only we've got 51% of voting shares, uh, but also we can dominate the board and management team. So this means that that will be an application to who dominates the uh, management team is the G company. And voting shares with more than 51%, which means the G company. Uh, we're not a larger entity because we, in terms of market value, as we can see that, uh, we only account for 44% of the total uh, entities value. So this means that not meeting with the three, the third criteria, and whether or not we spend cash to buy shares, yes, uh, for the 35% of the original shares that we spend cash or not. Okay. So um, I would say that from these clues that, okay, so whether or not we can get variable returns from it, my answer is certainly yes, because it's now my subsidiary. It's our subsidiary. You can get the dividend okay, from it. So uh, that's how we do it there. Now, um, my conclusion, yes, you will uh, have different conclusions of that. So, for example, the first con conclusion would be the G company is the uh, acquirer. They can also say to the examiner, but it will be affected by other factors. For example, in terms of factors, determined from uh, the IFRS number three business combinations. Alternatively, 
you can say that per the substance over form principle that the legal form of the transaction is like uh, so we are having for example dominating the board at more than 50% of voting shares but when we are determining who should be the acquirer we need to assess it in combination with other factors determined in the IFRS business combinations according to the substance over form concept okay so if I were you, I'll just pick up one of those and, and that will be absolutely enough there. Now, uh, I've written my own answer, okay, as you can see there. So firstly, I quote from the IFRS 3 and the Consolidated Financial Statements, as we are told just now. And with the application, okay, for each point, yes, in the actual exam, you can use this point format. It will be absolutely fine there, okay, this is not... The, what is so called the bullet point format? No, because I write it in full sentences. Now, for example, I would say that we spend cash on, and 35%, and, and it will be quite a significant part of the total purchase consideration, because out of 100% of your shares, 35% belong to my company, and that's quite huge. And on 1st April onwards, yes, we own more than 51%, more than 50% of voting shares, means that we've got power instrument and you are my subsidiary and then the CEO yes we talk about although it's from the L company but uh, actually dominates the whole board and in terms of market value okay so we are less than the L company which means the G company is less than the L company so this means that this criteria is not met but this will not stop us from uh, classifying the G company to be, a, to be the acquirer. So making our own conclusion, okay, we need to determine other factors, okay, uh, by focusing on the substance of the transaction rather than its legal form. Now, making sure that 10 marks, 10 sentences, you can easily pass this particular requirement. But making sure that, if I were you, is that for each of the sentence, from the exhibit, my advice to my students would be to comment on vote. Okay, so you can simply copy and paste that into your answer. But if I were you, I'd like to, uh, I mean, modify the original sentence from the exhibit a bit further. Okay, so just to make sure that I tell the marker that I'm not copying the information from the case without any comment at all. So if I were you, I'd like to put my comment firstly at the first sentence and then I quote from the exhibit information. And that would be a, a good practice to show that you're not simply copying the information from the case. Right there, okay, so that's the exhibit number one. I hope you're happy, which means the requirement A. Now let's move on to requirement B, is to calculate goodwill and to make a comment of that using the exhibit two information there. So we are told that on 1st January, yes, we pay 34 million shares for 35% of capital of the layout company. On 1st April, yes, we issued, because we performed the share for share exchange, we issued 25 million shares at $1 each to acquire the remaining 65% of the target company. And our share price would be 2.85 uh, on the on 1st April, which means at the date of acquisition, okay, of the remaining 65% shares. And we're also told that, okay, so the market value of green would be 70 and 90 for the layout, and we treated the 35% shares as the associate, yes, because more than 20%, and that'll be associate. And the carrying value on the date that we've obtained control was 36, and we need to update that to fair value, okay? And we are also told the identifiable net asset of the L company was 87, so this means that in order to compute the goodwill, we are actually calculating how much we're overpaying to the L company, so we need to subtract that 87 in order to arrive at the goodwill figure. Now, my advice when we are calculating the goodwill is firstly, is the layout the formally and then slot the figures in and that's it. And from my perspective, you don't really have to get the final goodwill figures right because the examining team, when we are marking your script and making sure that you include every figure in, 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 into your calculation. And, and, and 
uh, if you're not sure how to do it, okay, just make a comment of those. Now, part B then. Uh, my mnemonic to calculate goodwill would be DCNN. -N. So, firstly, we've got considerations and we need to update them into fair value. Uh, in this particular paper, there will certainly be the first investment at the fair value, not the carrying value, and the second investment, because that will be a step acquisition, which means uh, before having control to having control. The NCI in this case will be zero because we have obtained 100% shares of a target company. So you need to plot the NCI and need to minus the net asset at acquisition date. Now, so uh, this will give me how much do we are overpaying the L company there. Now, let's see then. On 1st January, we paid 34. And the 34 has been updated to the carrying value of 36. All right. So what will be the fair value of that then? So we are actually saying that because the market value, which means quite fair, which means the fair value of equity of that subsidiary, which means the L company, was $90 million okay, at the times that we buy the L company. And the amounts that we are not buying okay, is zero because we now bought 100% of those. So this means that for the 35% of those shares at the fair value would be, I would take the market value on the acquisition dates where we, obtain, where we obtained control and times by the original 35%. So this means that what would be the fair value for the original 35% shares there? The L company's market value, we're told 90 million. So that being the case, the first investment uh, fair value of consideration would be 31.5 million there. And after that, we also issued 25 million shares and the share price, yeah, because we are paying that, we are paying with our shares, the share is actually worth 25 million times by $2.85 each. So we take 25 million that we are issuing times by $2.85 each. That becomes $71.25 million. At the same time, we also told that the uh, equity value, yes, uh, the fair value of the identifiable net asset, right, so the L company was 87. Now, 87 there. Uh, So plus and minus all together, that give me 15.75. Okay, that's it. Now, it's totally acceptable from my perspective that for the first investments, when we are computing the fair value of that, which means the 35%, what you can do is that you can use the fair value of that equity for 87%. It's absolutely fine though. Okay, so you can score reasonable marks by doing that stuff. Now, in terms of calculation, yes, you're getting full marks regarding this. And if I were you, I know that there will be one easy mark that we can get, which means for the first investment, how about changing from the carrying value to the fair value? Now, because the carrying value of that associate, we are told it was how much? The associate's care va uh, carrying value was 36. Okay. We update that to the fair value. The fair value, we're told about 31.5. So this means that there's been a decrease in value by 4.5 million. 
So this means that I will say to the examining team that this will be one easy mark. The 4.5 million loss should be taken to the consolidated PNL. So making sure they directly put that into the PNL as a loss. Okay, so that's how we do it. One easy mark, always remember you can get them. Right there, okay, so far that we finish off uh, the part A and part B of our requirement. I'm going to be stopping the tape now and I look forward to seeing you in the next recording about the part C and especially the part D. Very tough requirement though. Okay, see you soon. Bye-bye. PC accounting for your future